Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna take a look at urinalysis. Now, urinalysis is a cheap, fast, and cost-effective diagnostic tool to have a look at what should or should not be present in the urine and can be a great indicator for disease or disorder. So let's go through what we can check in a urinalysis one by one. So first thing is let's have a look at color. So color is something you can obviously just take and look at. It can be something that's clear, or it can be cloudy or anything in between. It could be colorless, or it could be amber for example, and anything in between. Now, what can change the color of our urine can be anything from food to drugs, for example. It could be the presence of blood. What about from clear to cloudy? It could be the presence of proteins or anything dissolved in the urine or maybe an indication of an infection. So just by looking at the urine can give you a great indication as to what may be going on. Specific gravity, this is the first test that we can actually perform using the urinalysis or the dipstick for example. And specific gravity is simply looking at the concentration of the urine. It's looking at the stuff in the urine. Now specifically, what it's looking at is something called the osmolality. And the osmolality is that concentration of stuff in the urine. So for example, if I were to check the specific gravity of water, it's going to be one, because there's nothing in water, it's just water itself. So it's the reference point, specific gravity of one. Anytime you put anything into that water, so let's say we start to dissolve some ions or maybe some proteins or maybe some sugar or glucose, for example, it's gonna increase the concentration of stuff in there or the osmolality. Now this is gonna increase the specific gravity. So if we take urine, it's obviously not gonna be a void of particulates or particles dissolved in it like water is, so it's gonna be a value greater than one. What you're gonna find is for urine, the specific gravity is usually between 1.003 and 1.03. So what this indicates is that, for example, if something's above 1.03, it may be an indication of dehydration. So more stuff dissolved in the urine itself or not enough fluid and so the relative proportion of stuff dissolved in is greater compared to the fluid. If it's below 1.003, it's gonna be an indication of hydration. Maybe an indication of overhydration. What can specific gravity tell us? Well, again, apart from the relative hydration status, it can be an indication of the presence of other things. So for example, if it's above 1.03, so looking as though dehydrated, could be the presence of glucose in the urine. So glycos or glucosuria, which is an indication potentially of diabetes, for example. It could be an indication of something called syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. What does that mean? So, Antidiuretic hormone, antidiuresis, to stop urinating. So ADH, antidiuretic hormone, pulls water back into the body. So syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone means it's pulling too much water back into the body, so the urine you produce is concentrated. So they could be just two potential reasons, glucosuria or syndrome of inappropriate ADH can be an indication if the specific gravity is too high. If it's too low, for, an exam for example, it could be an indication of something called diabetes insipidus. Now diabetes mellitus, mellitus means sweet, sweet like sugar, because there's glucose or sugar in the urine. Diabetes insipidus, it's not sweet. There's no glucose in that urine. It's actually a problem up in the brain with not enough antidiuretic hormone being produced. So too much dilute urine is being produced and that could be an indication of a low specific gravity. Again, they're all just indicators. So pH, pH is looking at the concentration of hydrogen ions and obviously looking at pH can be a great way of looking at whether there's any acid base imbalances. So for example, somebody can have a respiratory or metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. So that means too much or too little hydrogen ions. Respiratory based means it has to have something to do with the breathing. So maybe if you're retaining too much carbon dioxide, 
that turns to hydrogen ions and your blood becomes too acidic. Maybe you're breathing off or hyperventilating and you're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide. That could be an indication of alkalosis. Okay, so your pH starts to go up. Acidosis, pH goes down. Alkalosis, pH goes up. Metabolic means there's something going on in the body, usually at the kidneys, and it's retaining too much hydrogen ions or getting rid of too much bicarbonate, for example. This can bear out in the pH test of the urinalysis. But what you should know is what the normal pH is. So for example, the pH can vary from 4.5 to 8. So that's quite significant. Usually it's sitting for urine between 5.5 and 6.5. Now what's that telling you? It's telling you it's slightly acidic. Now you can change the acid base through food, for example. So ingesting proteins, Proteins are made up of amino acids, right? The acid portion gives you an indication. When we break down proteins and amino acids, we turn it into ammonia. Our body doesn't like handling ammonia, so it turns it into urea. That comes out in our urine, and urea is acidic. So if you have more proteins in your diet, your urine will be more acidic. Now, if the urine is more basic, it could be an indication that there's bacteria present that eat up or split the urea. So a UTI could be an indication of an alkaline based or a basic urine because it's breaking up that urea. But it could also be an indication of a number of other things like I said food for example. So pH again just an indicator. Glucose. All right. So glucose is small enough for our kidneys to filter. Remember there's a filtration membrane called the glomerulus. So if I were to draw up the filtration unit of the kidney called the nephron there's different aspects of it. So right here is where you actually filter the blood. So the blood's gonna come in, turn into something called a glomerulus, and then the blood's gonna go out. And if it's small enough, it gets filtered through this sieve or this filtration membrane, called the glomerular filtration membrane. Glucose is small enough to get filtered into this, tube, into this nephron and these tubules, but what should normally happen is all the glucose that gets filtered should be thrown back into the blood of the body. So what that means is anything that ends up at the other end of this tube, that comes out in our urine. So that means all the glucose that gets filtered actually gets thrown back into the body and doesn't come out in our urine. So our urine shouldn't actually have glucose in it. But if it does have glucose in it, what can be it be an indication of? So maybe somebody has ingested far too much sugar, far too much glucose, and the transport molecules that bring it back into the body have been overwhelmed, and it can't bring it all back. So there's an overload of glucose, and it just carries out into the urine. Or it could be an indication of diabetes. So remember, diabetes is a problem with handling glucose. So type 1 diabetes, you don't produce the insulin. Type 2, you produce it, it just doesn't really work. And insulin is that key to tell the cells of the body, like muscle cells, for example, and fat cells, to take the glucose and bring it in from the blood. But if that insulin isn't there or doesn't work, the glucose stays in the blood and it overwhelms this filtration and it comes out in the urine. And as we know with di diabetics, wherever the glucose goes, it pulls water with it. That's osmotic that's an osmotic effect, and it can lead to increase in urine production as well, polyuria, more urine being produced over time. So glucose, good indicator of diabetes. Ketones, also a good indicator of diabetes, but more specifically, type 1 diabetes. Now, why? What is ketones? So ketones usually aren't present in the urine. Ketones are an alternate energy source Alternate from glucose, that's our primary energy source. Ketones are an alternate energy source. What happens is this. Glucose turns into energy through a process known as glycolysis. Glucose goes to pyruvate. Pyruvate jumps into the Krebs cycle of the mitochondria. That creates products that jump into the electron transport chain that produces about 36 odd ATP molecules. Glucose can only do this if insulin's present. If insulin's not present, the body tries to make glucose. It makes it from non-glucose based sources like fats and proteins. And what happens is all these fats come in, get broken down, and they start to back up. And when they back up, they go through an alternate pathway of energy source production, and that's the pathway of ketones. Now, so type one diabetics, they, have, they produce zero insulin, right? No insulin. That means 
no glucose being produced, no glucose being utilized for energy. So all these ketones being produced. Type 2 diabetics, they do produce the insulin, which means the glucose is undergoing, whatever glucose gets into the cells, is undergoing this glycolytic process. So the ketone production will be minimal, right? So that's why type 1 diabetes producing ketones is a good indicator. But ketones are also produced when somebody is on a very low carbohydrate diet. So somebody could be producing ketones if they're not ingesting much glucose at all in the first place. So their only option is to produce the ketones for energy. Take the fatty acids, break it down to produce ketones. All right, blood. Now blood is probably not the right term to use here, but what we're referring to in this test is actually, it measures something called peroxidase activity. And peroxidase activity is actually an indicator of hemoglobin, myoglobin, and erythrocyte function. So hemoglobin, myoglobin, and erythrocyte function, that's actually what this aspect of the test picks up, not just blood. Now, hemoglobin carries oxygen around the body. Myoglobin carries oxygen in the muscle. That's what the myo is referring to. Erythrocyte is the red blood cell, which obviously carries hemoglobin. Now, generally speaking, erythrocytes do not get filtered. They're too big. Cells don't get filtered here at the glomerulus. So if you've got erythrocytes present, could be an indication that there's damage at this membrane, or there's some sort of infection or some sort of damage to the tubules itself or something lower down. Lower down could be the ureters, it could be the uh, bladder, it could be the urethra, for example. What about myoglobin and hemoglobin? Well, they could be present, they do get filtered, right? But usually they get reabsorbed back in. So their presence in the urine is very low. So again, it's an overabundance that's going to lead to their presence in the urine, overproduction. So for example, it could be uh, somebody doing exercise. So marathon runners or some, somebody performing intense exercise may find that their hemoglobin myoglobin levels in their urine goes up, but it should be transient. So it should obviously fix itself within 48, 72 hours. Or it could be a crush injury. So if something crushes the muscle, it's gonna release all this myoglobin. And again, that's gonna come out in the urine. So it could be an indicator of that. But again, could also be an indicator that there's damage to the um, filtration membrane itself, or the nephrons, or the tubules, for example, or something lower down. So an infection could actually increase those numbers. Protein. So the only types of proteins that can get filtered are proteins that are less than 20,000 Daltons in size. That's the molecular weight. So anything that's smaller than that gets filtered at the glomerulus. Some proteins are greater than that, some proteins are smaller. Some proteins that are smaller than that that get filtered include albumin and some globulins. They're usually carrier molecules. So sometimes they're gonna be carrying insoluble substances and they get filtered through. Again, a lot of it gets reabsorbed back into the body. Some of it does come out. So what can increase the presence of protein? Well. It can happen transiently or long-term. So transiently, things like heart failure can do it, increasing that pressure that's happening. It could be damage to the glomerulus. So glomerulonephritis can, can cause this as well. So that's usually a long-term cause. So it could be short-term or long-term. Short-term, heart failure, exercise, fever, stress, long-term, usually some sort of nephropathy, such as glomerulonephritis can increase the presence of proteins. Nitrites, all right. You usually should have zero nitrites in your urine. You shouldn't have any at all. You have nitrates, but no nitrites. But what happens is we can have the presence of bacteria, and these bacteria can turn the nitrates, with the A, into nitrites, with the I. And so the presence of nitrites tell you there is bacteria present, which can be an indication of a urinary tract effect, infection, wherever that infection may be. Leukocytes, white blood cells, good indication of infection. So this infection, again, could be a great indicator of UTI, but usually you'd need to do some sort of culture to say that bacteria is present for a UTI. If not, no bacteria present, could be just some type of itis, right? Some sort of, whoops, inflammatory response that's happening. So it could be inflammation 
of the nephron itself, of the kidney, something of the ureter, bladder, urethra. So this could also increase the amount of leukocytes present. All right, last one, bilirubin and urobilinogen. Your red blood cells, when they die, they go to the spleen. So you've got red blood cells, they go to the spleen. The spleen breaks up hemoglobin and globin, and the heme goes to the liver, and the liver turns it into bilirubin. All right, that's the first thing, bilirubin. Now, bilirubin can be unconjugated or conjugated. The liver conjugates it. What that means is it makes it water-soluble so it can float around in the water of our body. If it's water-soluble, it can be filtered. So some conjugated bilirubin can be present in the urine, some. What usually happens is this, the liver that makes the bilirubin conjugates it and sends it to the bile, right? Which is the gallbladder. And the gallbladder releases it into the small intestines. And so this can come out in our fecal material or it can get reabsorbed back to the liver. All right, now here's the thing. When it's in the bile, as in the small intestines, this is where it turns into urobilinogen. Bilinogen, okay? And again, this can go to the liver for reabsorption. So, what is all this telling you? This is all telling you that the presence of bilirubin and urobilinogen in the urine can be an indication that too many red blood cells are breaking down. This is known as hemolysis. It could be an indicator that the liver is dysfunctional. All right, so some sort of hepatic disease or maybe some sort of hepatocellular disease. Or it can be an indication that there's a problem with the bile or bile ducts, so the biliary system. That's what it's telling you. That's what it's an indicator of. So this is a quick run through of urinalysis.